tasting facts. I hope we're going to have a really fun evening, really nice evening. You can relax, kick back, you can drink, you're not driving anywhere. I think most of you are at home. So just enjoy. Fortunately, most of you, fortunately for me, most of you are muted because as you drink more, you talk more. You can talk amongst yourselves and you won't be bothering me. Everything's fine. <laughs> um, a few basics of the tasting. I'm going to be tasting with a, a small little uh, tulip shaped wine glass. You can taste with a big tulip shaped wine glass. This is the type of glass sort of that you should be drinking from. I think other things that we're going to be needing, corkscrew, I like to use this, it's called a waiter's friend. We'll open a bottle together as well. Um, just, we'll go through the basics of, 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 of opening and tasting wines. Also, I've got a bucket with me because at 3 a.m. I don't think I'm going to be drinking very much. I think I basically have to look at this evening as if I'm on a plane because when you're on a plane, you can drink at any time. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's give it a go. I'll give you a few words of introduction about uh, uh, the winery. Danielle said, said a lot of it to, to begin with in my introduction. Uh, but I, I came to live in Israel after the Gulf War in 1991. And my parents joined in 1992. In 1992. And uh, my dad was involved in um, the UJA in, in England and always really wanted to invest in a business in the Galil. Um, and when, when he came, he said, come, let's, let's do something together. Let's do something together in the Galil. Let's find a business that will act as, a, act as an anchor and act as a focus to the Galil and bring, uh, bring people up and bring some identity to the, to the area. So we were looking around for all sorts of businesses that were connected to, to land and connected to farming and connected to uh, agritourism and, and stuff like that. And we came across this small winery that was uh, on the verge of bankruptcy. And we thought it really encapsulates what we're looking for um, uh, to invest in in the area. Um, so in 1990, 394 we invested in the in the Dalton winery we started it up we um, uh, again we did our maths we were wrong by a factor of 10 but uh, here we are 25 years later um, growing from the initial harvest of 25,000 bottles to I hope this year we'll be got will be harvested we'll be making about 1.2 million bottles we sell 70% of the wine in Israel. We export uh, 30%. Uh, our major export markets are the United States and Canada. We do very well in Canada. We sell through the LCBO. We sell through the sacramental uh, market as well. Um, you're going to have to excuse me. It is 3 o'clock and my brain and my mouth haven't caught up with each other. But... Um, We'll start. We'll start with the wine, and, and and let's and let's see how and let's see how it goes along. We make a vast amount, a vast range. We make about 30, 32 different wines. We're going to be tasting four wines this evening. There's a little a little picture of the wines that we do make. We've got um, what, the Canaan wines, which you're probably familiar with, and then we go to the estate wines, which we're going to be tasting. One of them, some of which we're going to be tasting tonight. Then we go to the Alma and the Reserve wines. We've got this new wine, which is called Galileo, which is uh, a premium blend, but let's start tonight with um, with the rosé. I hope you've chilled the rosé and the chardonnay nicely down. Let's open it together. That's part of the fun is uh, is opening it. So take out the uh, the what the uh, capsule cutter. You cut around the top of the bottle. Lift up, lift up the um, the foil, and then we take the screw. And we, we twist the screw into the cork like this and we um, lever it. We've got the, the little notch goes onto the top of the bottle and we lever the wine open like that. There you go. You should have the cork in one hand, the bottle in the other hand. And we'll pour ourselves a sip. It 
So, as I mentioned, we started the winery in the upper galley, and I think we've really achieved our, our, our objectives. The thing I like about wine is that it really is an ambassador for any region that it comes from. It encourages people to come and visit uh, the places where the wines are made. I think a great example is um, when the Olympics were held in Australia, um, tourism, wine tourism and, and, and uh, wine sales of Australian wine really, uh, uh, re really set record levels. And, and the same thing we're seeing with wine. We have everyday people coming to visit us in the winery. The winery has a very, very active visitor center. And uh, we're, um, we have brought focus to the Upper Galilee. We brought tourists to the Upper Galilee. All of you, once all this uh, corona business is over with, you're all invited to come and come if you're in the area, come for a visit, come and drink some wine with us and we'd be happy to look after you and happy to host you in our visitor center. Let's talk a little bit about this, uh, this rosé wine. Rosé wine is in our estate series. Put it here behind me. It's made primarily from Shiraz and Grenache, harvested from vineyards in the Galil, the lower and the upper Galilee. Let's take a little sniff. We swirl the wine around because when you swirl it around, it releases the aromas of the wine. Take a sniff. And it's just a little bit of cotton candy and a little bit of um, tutti frutti chewing gum, if you would. Lots of berries, lots of fruit, very fresh, very, very, very appealing fruit. A little bit of sweetness on the palate, really nicely balanced. Um, really quite delicious for a three o'clock on a Friday morning. Um, if you, by the way, if you have any questions, text them in and uh, Danielle will ask them to me as we go along. If, are there any questions at the moment? I'd be happy to answer them. None so far, but yeah, just uh, send a chat to me directly, Danielle Faber, and I'll pass them along to Alex. Okay, because oh. I'm, I'm not seeing the questions, so, um, so uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to send them to Danielle. Any comments, how's the wine? Any questions about how the wine is? Anything? No? There's a, there is a question they, um, from Stephen wants to know, when would be the best time to uh, eat our grapes and cheese? Oh, um, anytime. The grapes actually are probably a little bit too sweet. So eat your grapes now because they'll probably go quite well with the, um, with the, with the, with the, with the sweeter wine. Don't have grapes with, as we go to the dry wines. Eat the cheeses whenever you want. Cheese is really good with wine because the saltiness enhances the sweetness of, uh, of, of all wines. So start eating cheese because it'll just make the wines taste better and make me look good. So you can start now. And we actually have one more question. Um, what percent of the wines are non mabusha Oh, so that's a good question. Most of the wines are non mabusha the wine that we're tasting now is non mabushal And in fact, um, all the wines that we're tasting this evening are non mabushal We primarily make mabushal wines for export. All the Knaan wines, which we send abroad, are mabushal And then we have um, limited runs of particular wines um, under particular labels that are, that are only mabushal So um, I would guess, say, a third of the wines that we export a third of the wines that we make are Mabushal, maybe less, maybe a quarter. A quarter of the wines we make are Mabushal, and we only make them for export. Israel, and we only, interestingly enough, we only make them for export to uh, the United States and Canada. England and uh, most of my other export markets aren't interested in them, and uh, the Israeli market isn't interested in, in it either. Um. Thank you. So people want to know what Mavushal is and how it really compares to non mavushal Is one considered superior to the other? Um, yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, so um, Mavushal wines. First of all, 
all our wines and all the wines that we make are kosher. And the wines have to be kosher before they're made mavushal. So making a wine mavushal doesn't make it kosher and doesn't make it more kosher. But what we do is we pasteurize either the juice or the wines, either before or after they're made. Um, uh, we pasteurize them at 90, 91 degrees Celsius, around that. Um, and what that means is that they are, um, they are able to be served and poured by people who are non-religious uh, or non-Jewish. That's how the Rabbanut defines it. I don't have any say or, 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 um, or, or, or um, uh, have, I don't have any say in the matter, but it's just one of the things we do in order to make the wines more commercially available for, the, for, for our markets abroad. Um, it's uh, in great demand for hotel use, uh, sorry, restaurant use and uh, many homes abroad, and we make it for those markets. Now, regarding the quality of the wine, I've done lots of blind tastings with lots of groups over the years. And when I offer them a bushel versus non bushel, 50% of the, of the tasters can spot the bushel wines and 50% of the tasters are correct in discerning which is mavushal and which is non mavushal. So my experience is that in the short term, uh, making the wine mavushal makes it much more, um, much more pleasant, much more uh, available to drink, much more open to drink in the first few years, but the aging potential of the wine is cut short um, uh, over time. Okay, are we ready to move? Sorry, Danielle. Uh, there are a few more questions, but I'm gonna save them. I'm gonna let us move on to the next and um, have some questions for the next round. Okay, so we'll move on to the Chardonnay. Yeah? Okay. So here's the Chardonnay. It's the green bottle. Green label, it's 2019 Chardonnay Estate. Again, the grapes come from great from vineyards in the Lower Galilee, near Kvartavor. Now I'm gonna use, because I'm drinking alone, I'm gonna use a little gizmo called a Korovin. This is a gizmo if you have it. It's not a cheap piece of kit, but it's quite useful for me who drinks it's quite useful for me and especially useful for me this evening because um, I don't know how many of these wines I'm going to continue drinking over Shabbat. But what it does is it, in, it's, I stick a needle into the bottle like so, then I press a button, let's empty the glass. Uh, let's see if you can see this. Can you see this like this? Maybe. I press a button here and it jet injects gas into the bottle and out pours a little taste of the wine and there you go and then I pull out the needle like this and the bottle is almost untouched. I've taken out a pour the bottle's untouched and I can leave this for another week, months, days. They say years, I don't give it years, certainly another couple of uh, months. And I can just put it back in the fridge and drink it with my family uh, on another occasion. The rosé will drink for Shabbat, so uh, that's why I opened it. It's still one of our always go-to wines. So, poured a little taste of the Chardonnay. Alex, um, just, just uh, we had a good question here. Does that work with, with uh, plastic corks? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the needle goes in and once you take it out, the, the cork will just recompress itself and seal itself. I mean, corks are elastic. They, they've got a lot of elasticity built into them. And um, when you pull the needle out, the, the, the cork seals itself. And what is the uh, utensil you used that, that does that? Well, this one, this thing, this thing, it's called a Coravin. So um, it has a, um, has a canister of 
argon gas that sits in the handle here. Um, and what happens is that the, um, you put the needle in and you press this button, it releases the gas. The gas pushes against the, uh, the wine and the wine pours out of this spout here. I'll do it again. We'll, I'm, I'm going to use it for, for the other red wines. So after the break, we'll use it again and I can show you how it works again. It's quite useful. It's a little bit expensive and a little bit of a luxury, but you know, I can, I can offset it against my expense as an expense. So uh, works for me. Right, back to the Chardonnay. Chardonnay from Quartevaux, Lower Galilee. Lots of apples. Are you seeing apples? Are you seeing pears? Lachaim, everybody. I can't clink glasses. That's one of the things about wine is we like to use all our senses. Um, so we look at it, we look at the color, and this is a, a light, a light straw color. And then we smell it. And then to use our sense of, of, uh, of hearing, we'll clink, clink it to each other. And then we'll taste it. So apples, apples and pears on the nose I see. Nice balance. It's not too acidic on the, on, the, on the palate. Nice, soft, nice, soft fruit, actually. Very nice. The acidity isn't too, um, isn't too obvious. It's nicely rounded, nice and soft. This wine hasn't seen any oak. Um, we crush it. The grapes come in. They're crushed. They're fermented. And it's uh, bottled fairly soon after harvest. So say that we're harvesting, this wine will be harvested um, probably, what's the date now, 17. It'll be harvested um, in about 10 days time. Uh, that's the first day of harvest. Chardonnay, because it's a little bit lower down in the Galil, it gets harvested quick, uh, sooner, sooner than any of the other grapes. We're expecting this harvest uh, to be in, in, in about 10 days time and then it'll be bottled probably in December. So it's a fairly quick turnaround for, um, uh, for the wine. Any questions? There are a bunch of questions not specific um, to the wines. Actually, this one is specific to the wine. I'll start there. How long are these wines good for optimal gain and drinking from a lane? Okay, good question. The rosé, between 12 and 18 months from uh, the year that is marked on the label. So say so this, this rosé is 2019. Um, it'll be good until um, mid-2021, generally speaking. The Chardonnay, I've tasted the Chardonnay that's been in bottle for two to three years and it's still good. But I would say as a general rule of thumb, for an unoaked wine, um, two to three years is, 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 a, is a good rule of thumb. I wouldn't keep it much longer. Unoaked wines, I would, I would tend to drink fairly quickly. Our Knaan wines, which are our entry level wines, I'm not sure if, who's familiar with them. They um, they're, they're meant to be drunk as soon as you buy them. And in fact, the, the statistic is that 95% of wines are drunk on the day that they're purchased. Uh, very few people go out and have, I mean, I take my computer and show you my wine fridges, but very few people take, the, um, take their wines and store them for years and years and years. Um, so yeah, I would say for the whites, for the, for the rosé, year and a half, for these young reds, for these young whites, uh, two to three years, aged whites, three to five years, and then reds, reds, I think they're tasting optimal three years after bottling, and they can go from anywhere from three to, depending on the wines, um, I think the Estate Series wines, five, three to seven years, and the reserve wines, I've drunk. 20 year old reserve wines and they're still pretty good. Um, 
Thank you. There were other people asking for food pairings. Food pairings? <laughs> um, okay. Chardonnay. I would put this with fish. I would put this with tomorrow night's roast chicken. I would put this with... Um, I would put this with grilled fish. I think it'd be really good. What else? I'd put this with cheeses as well. I don't know, you're all, all sitting at home eating cheese. How's <laughs> it going with the cheese? Does it pair well? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up, so... Uh, <laughs> Spectacular. And there were actually some questions specific to Chardonnay. So there are uh, two. One is why are some Chardonnays oaked? And the other is, uh, what gives the Chardonnay that earthy taste at the end of the flavor? I don't know if those two questions could be related, but... Okay. Chardonnay is, is traditionally oaked in, uh, in California, oaks a lot of its Chardonnays. Burgundy also oaks a lot of its Chardonnays. It adds complexity to the wine. Uh, this weekend, like this, um, uh, this wine we... We judged the fruit and we felt that it was, it was good to keep it light and fruity. I don't think it would benefit too much from, from a lot of oak, uh, oak influence on it. Every uh, winemaker will take, will take a look at, its, at, at his or her vineyards and they'll take a look at the fruit that comes out of it and they'll s decide whether it's worth the investment in, uh, in barreling. Barreling costs a fair amount of money. Uh, an oak barrel these days from France costs uh, about 750 euros. So it's a quite significant expense when you do barrel it down. A lot of winemakers like the extra flavor that the oak gives. Um, and then there's what we call, a, there's a secondary fermentation called malolactic fermentation, which, they, uh, which the wine goes through in barrels, which adds also a buttery character to the wine. And um, people, uh, people like that. People like to build that character into, into their grapes. I don't know what it says about the grapes. It adds complexity, it adds depth, and it adds, adds breadth to the wine. Um, and it also adds time before you bring it out to market. So we've chosen to bring this out quicker. It's, uh, it's also pretty good for our cash flow that way. Thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> uh, before we move on to our last uh, two bottles, we actually have, um, I, I'd like to introduce Ms. Mitch Shupak. So he is from Jaffa Dallin, who uh, Sharon spoke about uh, earlier in the programming. So we have some words from him. Shalom. I hope everybody in Canada is well. My name is Mitch Chupak. I'm the Director of Development of the Jaffa Institute. We are so grateful for your partnership, for your support, for your caring, for your love. We are really, really in the midst of a world global pandemic. And we know that the populations in Israel who are so, so badly affected are those that on a regular day do not have the ability to put food on the table. You have chosen a great project, Yafo Dalid. Jaffa Institute opened Yafo Dalid many years ago on the basis of uh, kids in a slum neighborhood that needed help in education, therapeutic services, and to push them through to finish high school, go to the army, come back and get scholarships for higher education. The Jaffa Institute does 40 different programs. One of them is Jaffa Dalid. And one thing that specifies Jaffa Dalid is that quite a few years ago, the city integrated into the community 92 Ethiopian families. Ethiopian families that came to Israel who don't know the culture, who don't know anything, do not have education, do not have funding or money except what they get from the Jewish agency. and we promise the city that we'll open our doors to help every Ethiopian kid in this community to make sure they integrate into society and to make sure that they too will be able to be productive citizens of Israel. And what we did is in opening our doors, we found that there was a big shortage of space. 
Our center can only hold certain amount of kids. And unfortunately, we always watch kids standing on the other side of the fence, looking in, wanting to uh, be part of the activities. And Jaffa Institute throughout the whole COVID crisis never shut down for one minute. You have to understand that we very quickly needed to make decisions because we're dealing with populations at high, high risk. Kids who, if they're not in any program or structure, fall apart. Families who don't have what to, food to put on a table on a good day. We have families and, and, and that have young kids that need uh, programming because of their problems. We have single parents who don't have what to give on a regular day to their kids, never mind during a crisis where kids have to stay at home. So what we did, we jumped into action and made strategic decisions to make sure that nobody, not one of our clients or anybody who comes to Jaffa Institute has to change uh, very far away from what we're doing. So we mobilized from many companies throughout Israel, partners with us, uh, computers, laptops. We work with uh, internet companies to get internet into these homes and we put in uh, computers to these kids so they can have daily activities with the group that they usually do. One of the things that the kids come to Yafodal, the first and most important thing that they do is have a hot meal because there's no food at home. And for these kids to come to Yafodal, have a hot meal, it was the greatest thing for them and their parents. But what do we do now the kids are locked at home? It's a bigger burden on the parents. So we mobilized our staff, we mobilized uh, a, a supermarket chain in Israel, Supersal, that were preparing uh, uh, food in takeaway uh, packages that were delivered hot meals to these kids every day. So these kids in Yafo Dalid continued their activities, continued to receive the individuals and group therapy through the Zoom meetings that they had with their counselors. And it, it was different, but we kept them engaged. Keeping them engaged is so important because we all know that we're all losing something during this period of time. And we need to make sure that these kids can continue in their education, can continue in their therapy, and can continue uh, moving towards our common goal of making them finish high school and go on the future life. I don't know how to thank all of you there. I wish I was there to hang out with you and uh, see you all soon that will happen because this thing is not gonna last. We are all stronger than Corona and we will all beat this. But I really, really wanna thank, say thank you to Sharon and the whole committee for your incredible leadership. Ruchi, who, we, who is a person at the JNF, thank you so much and you replaced Esther. Thank you, Esther, if you're watching. And um, also, the whole committee, Danielle and Jordan. And also I wanna thank Dalton Winery for doing this great thing of uh, uh, donating back uh, from the purchases of wine. I wish I was there to raise a glass of wine. Dalton is a great wine. Maybe they wanna take me for their commercials, uh, but definitely I'm into the Merlot. So I, I wanna raise a glass to all of you. Thank you your partners with us, your family with us. We can't wait that you, till you come to Israel to see. We will be sending shortly pictures once we start the actual construction and movement once the city says that it's safe because there's new regulations around that also with COVID. Stay well, stay healthy, stay strong. And we so much appreciate all you do for Israel and for the Jaffa Institute. Leitraut. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, it's always great to hear updates from Jaffa Dalet and, and kind of get exposure to what um, all of this good is, is going to. Um, Alex, I'll let you move on. Just maybe at the end, I have a bunch of questions that we can, we can do the last two wines and then maybe at the end that we can loop back and I can ask the last few questions. Okay. Um, just a question. I sent wines to a family in Jerusalem. Are they here with us? Did they? meet the challenge of getting up at three o'clock in the morning or are they not with us? Do we know that? I 
I'm not sure. But if you're here, uh, you can unmute yourself and say hi. Okay. Maybe not. <clears throat> so the next wine we're tasting is the blue label. It's the Grenache. A little bit about Grenache. Grenache is a, over the years, because Israel is such a young winemaking country um, and traditionally was dominated by, um, by Bordeaux varietals, by, it was the wine industry, the modern wine industry uh, was set up probably by, well not probably, was set up by the Rothschild family who had a lot of holdings in Bordeaux. So they brought to Israel what they knew, which was Cabernet and Merlot. But um, over recent years, um, the industry has been uh, looking more towards varietals which work better in, um, in warmer climates. Um, Shirazes and Grenaches and um, wines that, that work better in, in the south of France and wines that work better in southern Europe and, and, and in Spain. And one of the varietals we've started looking at is, is Grenache. So in 2014, we started making um, our first varietal Grenache. The wine that we're going to be tasting today is a 2017 Grenache, which I have a sample without a label on. Um, so you have the actual label bottle. I don't, but that's fine. And we're going to use this Corbin again, push it in. Then we're going to put that. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm with you now. So as you can see by the color, first of all, look at the wine. It's a much lighter color than many red wines that you've seen. That's a characteristic of Grenache. There are some heavier ones. This one, this one's a lighter one. It works really, really well in, 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 in warmer climates. This, uh, the grapes for this wine came from our vineyards, newer vineyards, as you'd imagine, because it's a, a new variety to us. It came from our vineyards in the Upper Galley. Um, if I remember rightly, it comes from uh, Evan Menachem, which is uh, in the Western Galilee. And if we, if we, if we uh, take a sniff of the wine, there's a lot of uh, cherries, a lot of burnt cherries here. This wine was aged in barrels for about uh, 10 months, eight to 10 months. It's written on the label actually. 12 months, 12 months in oak. Probably second use barrels. Barrels are a bit like tea bags. You get a big hit of, uh, big hit of flavor, big hit of vanilla flavor the first time you use them. And then as the years go by, you you get less and less uh, flavor coming from them, but you get what they call, what we call micro oxygenation. You get, uh, because wood is porous and uh, you get a little bit of air flowing into the, um, flowing into the wine, which just softens the tannins a little bit and softens the wine a little bit uh, and uh, makes it, uh, gives it a little bit of a vanilla character and just softens it a bit. Tutti frutti flavor is what I would describe it as. Nice, soft, light, easy drinking wine. It's not heavy. It's very, very, you know, this is a type of wine which I would, I, I would probably put in the fridge as well if it's, we're coming into summer. I don't know what the weather's like in Toronto at the moment. I've only been there when it's minus 40, but, um, in Israel, it's 30 degrees outside. I would put this in the fridge for half an hour, bring it down to about 15 degrees, drink it slightly chilled, and I think it'll be delightful. 
we'll show my email sheet. Alex, we have um, we have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, you know, general questions about uh, the wine and and the winery. So maybe oh. I can ask a few of those uh, before we move into you know the last wine that you know some of us are going to move on to. So somebody asked about re what recent years have been the best for your wines and what makes a year better than another? That's from Len. Okay, Len. Some of the good vintages, 2016. Um, Schmitta generally is a good, Schmitta vintages, which unfortunately don't get exported, but they're generally very good vintages in Israel. So that was 2015 and uh, Seven years before that, 2008 was a stunning vintage. 2016 was a great vintage. We're expecting 2020 to be a really good vintage. Um, the spring was really cool. We had a really good winter with lots and lots of rain. We had a very, very cool spring until June. We were, weather was, um, temperatures in Tel Aviv were in the 20s, which is quite unheard of. Um, and that means long, nice long ripening periods, nice long hang times. Um, so we're expecting this year to be a really good year. Uh, what else is a good year? 2010, I think. And more recently, 17, 18, also pretty good. Um, what years do we have? I'm just trying to think. We have a super premium wine that we only make in special years. So. We made it in 2013, 2014. We're bringing out the 2017 now. That was a pretty good year. We're pretty good. We, we, look, we have fairly stable weather here. We know more or less what to expect. We're allowed to irrigate so we can, we can control the growth of the, of the vineyards. Uh, we know how to take care of the grapes from, from the sun. We use what they call canopy management, where you learn how to cover the grapes with the leaves of the vines. Um, so we know more or less how to keep a consistent year, but I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to this year. I think if, uh, if the coronavirus doesn't shut us down over vintage, which I don't think it will, um, we will, uh, we'll be having a really, really nice year this year. Um. Thanks. And the wines that you mentioned, would most of them be available for us, most of us here in Toronto? Yeah. Um, we sell through the, um, we have three or four wines listed at the LCBO. And uh, then they, through the, uh, through the shawls, you can buy a lot of our wines. Okay, thanks. Uh, we actually have a live question from my sister here. She wants to know why is the Upper Galilee known for its grapes? Uh, because we, um, we have the elevation. As, you go up to, as we go up to, 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 to where the winery is located, to Merom Galil, we're going up to 800, 800, 850 meters. Our vineyards range from about 600 to, uh, 600 to 800 meters. And as you go up, you get one degree less every hundred meters, every hundred, oh, it's too early in the morning. As you go up, the weather gets cooler and we get nice cool evenings. We get long ripening times and it just, longer ripening times mean that the sugars and the phenolics, of, well, the phenolics are the things that give the wines flavor. They all gradually go up at the same time. The lower you go, then the, the phenolics will go like this, the sugars will go out, up like this, and, and, and the flavors and the, sh and the sugars won't, won't meet up. So the higher you are, that um, ripening of the, 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 uh, the ripening of the sugars and the ripening of the flavors, they're more or less in sync. And that's, that's the benefit of being, of being higher up. You just get cool, cooler weather. Great, thanks. So we have a question from Mickey and a question from Sandy. Sandy wants to know how many vineyards do you have? And how many total labels do you guys produce? Okay, so we have, we have 800 dunam, which is 80 hectare of vineyards under our own management and 200 hectare and 20 hectare under uh, contract from, 
from from farmers who we uh, who we manage. Um, they're all over the Galil, uh, Upper Galilee, uh, Western Galilee, Lower Galilee. We have uh, one or two vineyards in um, down in Gadara, which is south of Tel Aviv, which is where our Petit Sira and our Muscat come from. And then we have one or two vineyards in the Golan Heights as well. Uh, what was the other question? How, how many labels do we have? Lots. <laughs> I, um, I believe in niche, in, in niche products and we have a lot of niche products. We probably have about 40 different labels. Um, <clears throat> and in those labels, we have um, Mavushal and non mavushal versions of the same wine. So that just adds, adds uh, skews into, into the product mix. Okay, great. Um, a lot of people asked about how to store the wines after tonight. Okay, so that's a pretty good question. You're going to have four half open bottles. Drink as much as you can. Um, try and finish. Try and finish as much. Seriously, you're not going anywhere this evening. Um, you don't have to drive. I'm going to bed. Um, but uh, if you have uh, hot, small mineral water bottles. The plastic ones, um, I don't have one here, and I'm not gonna disappear on you to bring one from the kitchen. But what I suggest, you take a, a, one of the half litre mineral water bottles, you pour the wine in it, the unfinished wine, you squeeze the bottle until the wine comes to the top of the cap, and then close the cap. That's, that a, that's a great tip. Um, most of you so, also do. Yeah. Sorry, continue. So that will, will allow you to keep the wine for another week or so. Still, the, the wine's going to oxidize. So you're going to have four, four of these bottles. Try and, try and finish them by the end of next week. I, they should be good for next Shabbat. Thank you. And I was going to say that many of you, most of you, if not all of you, should have gotten wine stoppers that you can put on the bottles. I know that that's not the recommended way, but uh, if you don't have a mineral water bottle, that, that well, you can get these. You can get these uh, vacuum corks, which are pretty good. Um, they're these uh, rubber corks where you suck the air out. That will also keep the wine good for for uh, probably two or three days. Again, uh, it'll get you through to Shabbat. The wines. All the wines you're opening this evening will be good for tomorrow evening anyway, if you want to use them. So you don't have to worry about them. Um, I wouldn't refrigerate them. The colder, colder liquids absorb oxygen quicker. So certainly the reds keep out, keep out of the fridge. The whites, because you're gonna, they need to be drunk cold anyway. So put them in the fridge. And if you drink them tomorrow, they'll be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, this is my favorite question and hopefully we'll all get to do this soon. What's the best time of year to visit you? Oh, after Corona, <laughs> anytime. We have, um, even during Corona, the winery has been open the, since, since, um, uh, since the, since we were allowed to go back to work, the winery has been open. We've been, ha we've been having lots and lots of visitors. We've got a huge, <clears throat> a huge garden in the back. Uh, we can do uh, social distancing very well. People come, they bring their families, they sit in their own little capsules and they, um, uh, and, they, and they enjoy a plate of cheese and drink some wines. Best time to visit us. We're open all the time. We're open every day except Shabbatot and Chagim. Erev Chag and Erev Shabbat where uh, we close midday. Um, come anytime. If you want to have a tour, uh, if you want to bring a few people and, and have a nice guided tour. And also at the moment, we're not doing tours because of, because of uh, COVID. So you can come and have a tasting and uh, hopefully after everything has calmed down a bit, we'll be resuming the tours and everything, but any time's a good time. Drop us a line if you want to come uh, and, and we'll take care of you. Okay, we have um, some political questions. Uh, 
We have a question about Dalton, has it been affected by BDS and, you know, kind of related to that, what can we as consumers do? And I don't know if this is related to BDS, but like, how can we get more of your wine in our stores? Is there anything that we can do as consumers? Um, have we been affected by BDS? Not really, I have to say. Um, <clears throat> one of the advantages and disadvantages of, of Israeli wine is that, um, um, I would say 90, 95% of our, of our consumers are, uh, are Jewish and pro-Israel and don't really care about BDS. Um, so, and because the wineries in the Galil and not in any of the disputed territories, it really, re I as a winery haven't, haven't felt it and haven't been approached by it. Um, you as consumers, unfortunately in Ontario, you're dealing with one of the worst and nastiest bureaucracies I've ever come across, which is the LCBO. Um, and just lobby the LCBO for more Israeli wines and go and buy, go whatever the LCBO is carrying, go and buy it and, and, and empty the shelves and they'll have, they'll be forced to buy more. Um, that's, uh, that's my advice to you. Thank you for uh, taking that question. And uh, one, one last question before we move on to the last one. What is your favorite one that you produce? Oh, good question. Um, one of the wines we drink every, not every day, it's, it's mo many days. Um, we really, I'm, this is the Alma series. So these are, these sit between the, um, the estate series, which we've just tasted, and the reserve taste, the reserve series, which um, some of us are about to taste. Um, these are two blended, blended wines. The um, crimson is a Cabernet-based blend, and the uh, scarlet is a uh, Shiraz-based blend. And these are our go-to wines uh, at the moment, at home. Lovely, lovely, delicious wines. Um, in Israel, they sell for about 80 shekels. I'm not sure what the, what, what price you'd find them from, what, what you'd find them in your synagogues. Uh, this also, this will be through, uh, the sacramental market. Uh, so that's, that's what we're drinking, uh, at home usually. And then the last wine that we're, we're going to taste, so I'll, I'll face you. The last wine we're going to taste is also, I opened, um, opened it recently and I think it's absolutely delicious. Um, I'm not sure how we're, how we're doing this because I understand that some people do have it and some people don't have it. Um, we're going to be elitist about it, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think the people who have it can fill up <laughs> glasses and if people are interested in, in hearing about it, please stay on. You're obviously more than welcome. Okay, so the last wine we're going to taste is um, from our reserve series. So our reserve series is um, it's really a a crafted series of wines. These are every year, every year we taste the wines um, three or four times throughout the year. And we, we, um, we taste and we categorize and we taste and we categorize and we taste and we categorize. And every time we taste, we bring wines down, excuse me. And, um, we start off by building the Canaan series, which is our entry level series. So those are the simplest wines. And then a few months later, we taste more wines and we build the estate series. And then we taste more wines and they, uh, they go into the uh, Alma series. And then the wines that are left generally are the best wines of any vintage and they go into the reserve series. So the wine we're tasting this evening is special for two reasons. First of all, because it's a reserve series wine. It's from 2016. So it's got a nice, it's, uh, it's got two years of bottle age because if it was made in 16, it was bottled in 18 and it's now 2020. Um, it's got two years of bottle age. So it's wine that's been allowed to develop a little bit in the bottle. And also the thing about Merlot Reserve is that we don't make it every year. We only make it when we feel that it's good enough to go into, into the bottle. So it's a special wine on all, um, for me, on all levels. And I'm glad we chose it because I opened a bottle recently and it's just really delicious. 
So we'll taste it together, and I'm again gonna core of it with this thing. Okay, so if we look at the color, first of all, we can see that the color is significantly darker um, than, the, than the Grenache we tasted. If we take a look on the nose, the aromas are much, much more concentrated. They're much deeper, they're much jammier, they're much, a um, lot of uh, fruitcake and a lot of, uh, uh, I'd use the term Christmas cake, but I'm not supposed to know about that. Uh, very, very dense, dense fruity character, lots of plum jam, lots of, um, lots of cooked stewed fruit aromas, really, really intense and really, really, really concentrated here. Also, I'd give it a little bit of time to open up in the glass. I'm using a small glass. If you have a bigger glass, you can pour it into a, in, uh, maybe pour it into a bigger glass here and give it a little bit of air because wine when it starts getting old it starts getting a little bit choked and deprived of oxygen starved of oxygen in the bottle so we either decant it I don't like decanters it just means lots of washing up but if you use a, a bigger glass a small pour and a bigger glass will do the same thing and the wine will just open up um, and let's taste it. Mm. Nice, sweet fruit, very soft and supple tannins. The tannins are the things that make you pucky, that if there are too many of them, your mouth gets puckered and you feel that furriness on the inside of your mouth. It's nice, it's soft. Nice acidity, nice length. Length is when you can taste the wine for a few seconds after you've finished, after you've drunk it. That's what we call length. This has got great length. It's really, really a very nice example of a, of a Merlot. And it's, it's a wine that I'm, I'm really happy with. And uh, really lovely, lovely, delicious wine. I think it's a great way to, uh, to end the tasting this evening. Thank you so much, Alex. I know that uh, there were some questions that we couldn't get to in the chat. Um, I'm sorry about that. We are kind of running low on time. Um, I just wanted to say, if you wanted to um, donate further to Jack Vidalid, you can reach out to JNF. We, we can give you, uh, there's, there's a link on our website where you can find to for, donate further to JNF. And, um, that's it from us and I'm going to pass it over to Jordan. All right. Hope everybody can hear me. Um, Alex, thank you so much for all the insight on the wines. It's always great um, to learn about wine. Uh, it's certainly a unique experience, I'm sure, for all of us to have this kind of atmosphere and also have you there in Israel. Uh, what a fantastic job. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Jordan Waldman. I'm the co-chair, uh, the other co-chair of JNF Future Toronto. Um, so thank you all for being here with us. And uh, as well, if, again, like Danielle just mentioned, if you wanted to support our project, the Jaffa Dalit Center, um, we would love your support. We're looking forward to achieving that goal of expanding the center. Uh, COVID has set us back a little bit, but we are pushing forward and we do hope to achieve that goal soon. Um, the link is, link is there in the chat if you're looking for it now. Otherwise, you can find it on the JNF Future Toronto website as well. And uh, we just want to wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. Stay healthy, stay safe, l'chaim. And uh, we hope to see you at some of our future events. Good night, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, Alex. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to all, all the participants. Thank you for coming. Really, I've been overwhelmed by by the amount of people that have participated. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Ruchi for bringing this to my attention and, and inviting me to take part. I didn't realize at the time it was going to be so late. I thought I got my maths wrong and I thought it was going to be at 1 a.m. but it was 3. But I hope I've done 
hope I've done all right by you. Hope I haven't been too in incoherent. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you so much for taking part. It's been real, really, really great. Thank you, Alex. Get some sleep. <laughs> yeah. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom, everybody.